British animation history frequently appears absent in British cinema history. Despite its influence on the cultural imagination, British animation will often be dismissed, forgotten, and a footnote in typically academic and critical studies. It's hard not to read media academic John Ellis's model of a British national cinema that being understated, unsensational, true, anti-fantastic, restrained, un-Hollywood as an attack on animation itself and its inherent spectacle. Even those academics and critics who champion the diversity in British cinema styles forget to mention the existence of British animation. In Julian Petley's voyage into the deep, flowing undercurrent in British cinema, he fails to include animation as a weapon in his anti-realist battle. Although he does name drop Len Lai and his formless traditions, but no mention of the artist's medium. Despite the lack of credit to their influence and place in British cinema, working class Watford born Joy Batchelor and her Hungarian husband and business partner John Halas founded Britain's biggest and most influential animation studio of the 20th century, Halas and Batchelor Cartoon Films. The effort changed the face of the industry in post war Great Britain. Though British animation history dates back to the 1900s and had seen brief enlightenment by a few bright sparks like Len Lai and Norma McLaren in the 1930s, the start of Halas and Batcher in 1940 marks an anchor point for all that came after it. Their secret formula was a heady mix of artistic ambition, opportunism and advocacy. John Halas in particular was not just a spokesperson and salesman for his company, he was pitching animation as a whole as an art form, a business, a unique form of visual communication. It just so happened that Halas and Batra cartoons were at the centre of it, and John and Joy's efforts put it there. This need for recognition is what glued their symbiotic relationship of John Halas and Joy Batchelor. To put their lives into a historical perspective, John and Joy were born at a critical time in European history. They were small children during the First World War and young adults during the Second. Each was the product of a great empire in decline. John Halas witnessed the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that brought about the First World War and the rise of fascism, and Joy, the subsequent end of the British Empire with the social political shifts that this brought about. These devastating changes had an inevitable effect on their work and thinking, as it did on that particular generation, causing major political shifts of population from Middle Europe to the UK and USA that enriched our cultures as well as destroyed them. They both believed that through the medium of animation, they could help create a better world creating a string of innovative shorts to support the war effort and the fledging welfare state. Some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. Halas and Bachelor did it all. Advertising and educational films, training and propaganda films, theatrical and TV commercials and television series. Most memorably, they pioneered the production of feature length entertainment animation films in England. The most famous of which being the stellar 1954 feature Animal Farm, based on George Orwell's landmark novel. Here is a cartoon with a difference. The first full-length cartoon film to be made in England. Produced by the brilliant team of Hallis and Bachelor, it has been acclaimed by New York and London critics alike. It tells a compelling story for every adult. Yet it's assuredly a film that every child can enjoy. Here is a quick crack into the creative imagination. What inspired it and what it inspired. John Halas and Joy Batcher's work, in a general sense, proves that realism and spectacle doesn't exist in a binary fashion, but a spectrum that works to complement each other, and specific to the British industry, proves its diversity. This has been a long-standing issue with animation as a medium. Animation has had a neglected and unfortunate place in the writing of film history and the history of film theory. Animation history itself remains a work in progress, attempting to discover those overshadowed by the monolith that is Disney animation. This work remains difficult due to neglect in archiving old animation cells, but also attitudes towards animation developed as unfavourable in discourse, such as authorship, the argument being it was considered too industrial and collaborative as a process. It also is unfavourably considered when discussed as a vessel for fantasy, imagination and cinema creativity. Even the fundamental aesthetic draw, the illusion of motion and the realisation of raw fancy, 
animation magic itself was late to the party. Long before the first major form of animation, the cartoon film, the experience of fantasy and comic incidents was available to the public through the films of Robert W. Paul and George Méliès, trick photography producing magical illusions. It was not until 1908, Emile Cole, a respected French caricaturist, established himself as one of the first animators to experiment in visual gags involving matchstick-like figures. The cartoon film, from its inception, had a healthy competition across the world, all trying to define what animation can do. This has resulted in a medium that is constantly experimenting. Roger Manville considered the healthy wealth of the experimentations in stylization to be mostly from the European artists. The 1920s and 1930s came an ecstatic expansion in animation with the emphasis still on stylization. Silhouette animation by German Lottie Reinegger brought the traditional Chinese shadow graph theatre to the modern screen. Abstract paintings directly on celluloid by Swedish Hans Richter and Viking Egerling. Stop motion puppetry by George Powell in Holland. Vladislav Stavich in France. Alexander Tushko in the Soviet Union are many key figures. Through the work of these pioneers, animation had found its precursor in a European model, which through animation's tradition allowed creators and arguably by the extension a national cinema to put their particular stamp on the cartoon. This lent itself as an appropriate medium for a propaganda film. What resulted in animation becoming a functional tool in a range of markets when the impending world wars around the corner? Manville concludes, Animation forms a significant part of modern graphic and plastic and kinetic art, in veins that include not only serious caricature, comic and satiric, but also lyrical, dramatic, and even at times, tragic responses to psychological, social and political themes, as well as purely aesthetic experiments in the more abstract branches of art. When considering Britain's role in contributing to the development of animation, it would be a great irony to not consider Halas and Batcher as the very embodiment of British animation itself. Halas and Batcher produced work that was always highly responsive to cultural context. They were committed to progressing the art form of animation, responding and enriched by the diversity of form and content animation had previously explored. Halas and Batch's philosophy and practice on what animation can do has observable parallels to the thesis of British realist cinema and the documentary movement. Their work for the art of animation have placed it on a progressive trajectory, troubling any thought that places the art form as predominantly Disney or as light comic entertainment. Their practice in animation as an actual democratic purpose closely follows Grierson urgencies of the 1930s, John Grierson being considered the grandfather of the British documentary movement. Halas and Bachelor's character Charlie, who features in various films which explore issues arising from post-war Britain. In style, Charlie caricatures almost entirely British responses to issues and is typically the embodiment of the British fondness for nostalgia. As the star of seven cartoons commissioned by government departments to communicate important information about the new Labour government's legislative reforms, Charlie, who was designed by Joy Bachelor, became the familiar face of official propaganda in the post-war era. Endowed with an average man-on-the-streets everyday charm, he had popular appeal, and his habitual cheeky riposts to authoritative commentary served to anticipate and, it was hoped, overcome the British public's characteristic scepticism about government-imposed changes. The subject of these shorts very much aligns itself with the documentary spirit. This new health service will be organised on a national scale as a public responsibility. The cost of the service will be met from rates, taxes, and national insurance, and so everyone will pay for it. Hmm, thought there was a catch in it. And everyone will benefit from it. When you're ill, you won't have to pay for treatment. I don't have to pay the doctor now. I'm on the panel. Yes, that's true, but your wife and children aren't. The panel system covers only half the population, and it doesn't cover hospital treatment or a lot of other things, does it? Now, suppose, just suppose, you fall off your bike. Suppose your brakes give out. You might have concussion as well. 
Their work not only had a social use and record, but also found animation to be the ultimate freedom of expression. This is evident in their frequent musings on the role of religion, war, patriotism, and science. 1967's The Question is arguably the apex of their exploration, which is incredibly abstract and fantastic in spectacle as it jumps through time and space. The work can be neatly tied up with John Halas's quote from the wildest fantasy to the coldest fact. Despite their engagement and assimilation of European modernist techniques, their work remains distinctly British. Paul Well observes that the art of Halas and Batcher is an interrogation of the ideas that define the developmental imperatives of British animation and culture since 1940. The impact of their work on the perception of animation in Britain can be traced to the efforts of creating firsts. The first stereoscopic cartoon film in Europe, The Owl and the Pussycat, 1952. The first full-length British animated film, Animal Farm, 1954. The first animated operata, Rudder Gore, 1967. And the first 8mm educational concept film, The Carters of Greenwood, 1964. And one of the first to compile animated works from around the world in the effort to preserve and promote the form. Halas and Batcher's originality and vision and their commitment to explore diverse approaches to form and content are the philosophy that ties together their assorted body of work. Aesthetically, Halas and Batchelor frequently opted for a naturalistic, realist approach, but were not afraid to explore abstract designs with Batcher's classic rubber balloon designs. But their house style always complemented the subject. In their widely acclaimed 1954 film Animal Farm, they resisted temptations to over-anthropomorphise much like how Donald Duck or Goofy look, and instead went for a more true-to-form look. Their naturalistic attempts arguably elicits a more sympathetic reception from audiences. This aesthetic approach even carries on over to the sound department, where the animal's natural sounds frequently intrude the English dialogue. Halas and Batch's work is a celebration of every vein and current found in British cinema, and problematises any rigid definition to a national cinema, and only offers the broader ideas and discussion around what exactly is a national cinema, satisfying both McLuhan-esque approaches and considerations to content and tone. Their legacy has defined British animation and anticipates many of the country's monoliths in the medium. Films such as The Yellow Submarine and The Snowman has clear influencing from Halas and Batch's sophistication and form. Considering one half of them is an outsider, they also help prove that anyone can embrace and interpret British culture and flourish as artists. Halas and Batch's contribution to animation in Britain undeniably deserves a place in the British cinema pantheon, not as a warrior for the side of realism or spectacle, but possibly to make peace between them. As noticed by Edgar Anstey, Halas and Batcher had found a solution of serving three masters, art, industry and the public, and turning the solution into a national asset. Through the work of these pioneers, British animation had found its precursor in a European model which through animation's tradition allowed creatives and arguably by extension a national cinema to put their particular stamp on the cartoon.